We're at Old Trafford today. David McDonald from the Daily Mirror is joining me. And uh, we've just been listening to Jose Mourinho ahead of the Sevilla game. But first of all, David, you were at the big one on Saturday. Uh, Mirror football got a big spread on uh, Man United Liverpool. Rashford obviously came to the fore, scored yeah. a couple of goals. But Jose was immediately saying, actually, Brighton and this game, Seville, are, are, are bigger than Liverpool already. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a question of looking forward rather than backwards. I think the point Jose was making was that United could have afforded to have lost points or dropped points against Liverpool. It wouldn't have been ideal. Obviously, their biggest yeah. rivals, a the game they always want to win, their fans want to win it. But I think the phrase he used was live or die you know, with Seville and with Brighton. Of course, they're knockout competitions. So that's, that was his message. Um, but it's a massive week for United. That was the perfect lift-off, the perfect yeah. start for them. Uh, Rashford coming back into the team, his first start since Boxing Day against Burnley. Um, you know, been a lot of conjecture, a lot of talk about you know uh, him in the World Cup. I think obviously Gareth Southgate has privately told Mourinho, "Look, he's going." And I, I don't think that anyone really thought that Rashford wouldn't wouldn't make the squad, even though he wasn't yeah. starting regularly for United. Um, but it just showed what a you know what a uh, enduring sort of you know gift he's got and, and you know threat he's got, goal threat, that pace. You know, the first goal was phenomenal. You know, the cut back inside. Uh, the finish was fantastic, and then of course he, he pounced for the second one. So, yeah, perfect start for United, but they've got two massive games, you know, none more so than this one uh, tomorrow night here. And of course, uh, Rashford's the future of Man United, but we had the past in the shape of Michael Carrick today, yeah. making a big announcement as well. Yeah, Michael Carrick announced today, I think everyone kind of knew really it, it'd been mooted. I think Jose Mourinho let the cat out of the bag a few weeks ago, saying that Carrick had effectively decided to call it a day, decided to hang up his boots at the end of this season. Uh, of course, he had the uh, underwent surgery for the irregular heart uh, heart rhythm early this season. I think in, after the game against Burton in the yeah. EFL Cup, he, he came off at half time and felt dizzy. Then, of course, everyone knows he had the procedure, the, the, the surgery. He's not featured often this season, but I think he's been very useful for, for Jose to have him around. You know, you bring in players like Scott McTominay through. Um, I think Carrick, you know, with the experience, he's 36, he's been here 12 years now. So his experience has been in invaluable. And you have to say, he's been a great servant to Manchester United. If you, if you think, look at the prices now. You know, the crazy yeah. transfer prices yeah, in, yeah, in yeah. today's market. I think he cost 18 million or 16 million mm -hmm. from, from Spurs mm -hmm. back in 2006. So, yeah, I mean, a great career. Um, and it'd be a great send-off if, if United could possibly win the FA Cup. I think, I think realistically, I don't think they're Champions League contenders. And Jose was saying that himself today. Yeah. I don't think anyone's considering that they're, they're amongst the favourites. But again, as Jose said today, if they can get through to the quarterfinals, beat Seville tomorrow night, anything is possible. So, yeah, Carrick's been an amazing servant for United. And I think, you know, from my dealings with him, and I think every, everybody, every football journalist who's had dealings with him you know, would, would say he's probably the perfect player to deal with. Yeah. Never, uh, never ducks a question. Yeah, always has time for it. Uh, time for us. So yeah, it'll be a great loss to the game. But mm. I think he's going to continue here in, in a coaching capacity, which I think is good. Yeah, excellent. So United, all good. But um, one one fly in the ointment for them is uh, City. If they win tonight at Stoke, really they're on course to perhaps seal the title in the Manchester derby on April the 7th. Yeah. And it, that might not be the only Manchester derby yet to come, might it? Oh, of course, yeah. I mean, if United get through, this is an extraordinary scenario, this. If United get through against Seville tomorrow night, they've got the Manchester derby, the Premier League, on April the 7th. But if they were to draw City in the quarterfinals, of course, associations aren't kept apart in the quarterfinal mm -hmm. stage um, as they are in the, uh, <clears throat> in the last 16. So there's every chance they could draw City, which would mean you'd have three Manchester derbies in a row. Because I think the week of April the 4th or 5th, or, sorry, April the 3rd or 4th is the quarterfinals. Then you've got the 7th, which is the Manchester derby. Then, of course, they play the return leg on the, the week after. So, yeah, it'd be an extraordinary, extraordinary situation to have three Manchester yeah. derbies in a row. And you have to say that it's, you know, United are probably favourites to go through. You know, Seville, we know that they've, they've scored away from home. They've, they've drawn 2-2 against Liverpool at Anfield. They came back from that epic 3-0 down at home and to draw 3-3. So they, they've got a goal threat about them, Seville. But I expect United to have enough firepower and they've got, obviously got home advantage as well uh, tomorrow. But they are vulnerable to that away goal. But if you expect United to go through, you know, they've got a great chance of obviously Liverpool, City yeah. and, and uh, you know, potentially Chelsea as well if Chelsea can get through. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a quite tantalising scenario that three Manchester derbies. Well, one team that, that did miss out on the Champions League last week was Tottenham. And I mean, this was pretty bad news for Spurs yeah. and it's obviously for England as well. Harry Kane, Kane Payne for Spurs in England. Uh, we don't know the extent yet, but that's a worry, isn't it? Not just Huge Tottenham, but, but England with the World Cup not far away. Yeah, you yeah. know, he's done his ankle again, which he has done before, hasn't he? Yeah, it seems to be a recurring thing uh, with, with Harry with his, with his ankle. And this was particularly nasty, the way he went over on it. And it, I think the pictures today, I think the pictures of him in the plastic boots boot, yeah. with, with crutches. So 
He's going to be out for several weeks at the, the, the best case scenario, you would think. And then, of course, that, that leads you into the scenario, as you say, Jerry, of the World Cup. You know, will he be fit and, you know, will he be match fit as well? That's the other thing as well. Because we've had been down this road before, I mean, with Beckham, Rooney. with Metatarsal, yep. Rooney as well. So it's a familiar path with England. And it, it does seem to, seem to afflict us with our star players. You know, I mean, I think you know, Kane on current form is, is arguably the best striker in world football. I mean, in terms of his, his, his goals and his, his all-round play. Um, and he's the man on, on whom England's you know hopes rest in the World Cup. Without him, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't think many of us expect England to, to to go all the way and win the World Cup. But I think you know with with the groups that they've, they've drawn, you know, with with the players they've got, there's an, there's an opportunity to get out of that group and, and potentially meet maybe Colombia in the in the last 16 and maybe get to the quarterfinal stage. But I think mm. if, if Kane's not in the in the, in the frame, then I think uh, I think you know, they've got no chance at all. So yeah, I think everyone's obviously keeping their fingers crossed that it's not as not as bad as first thought. But it doesn't look good. Yeah, I've seen the pictures of him today with the uh, the plastic yeah. boot on. It's going to be some time, isn't it? We think. Yeah. Now, one story which we can't can't escape. Back in London again at the weekend, West Ham. Uh, yeah. What we got here? Recipe for mayhem. Neil Ashton saying. The Pine Mash Brigade will never take to the soulless London Stadium. Yeah. It's it's an unhappy place at the moment, isn't it? It's not just about the stadium. I think it's about the way the club's been run. Yeah. And they're really very dangerously close to that relegation zone as well, aren't they? Yeah, they are. I mean, I think look when David Moyes came in, I think yeah, I think they uh, they had a real um, uplift in terms of results. I was, I mean, I've been down there th- this season, but certainly I was at the Huddersfield game and they won four one, and they were rampant there. And yeah. That, that took them almost to mid table, I think. So. That, that, that kind of seemed to lift them out of the danger zone. And then, of course, they're back into it now. And I think, as Martin Noble said this morning, he spoke quite eloquently about it, you know, this kind of unrest has been bubbling under for some time. Yeah. It, it's, and it's come to a head with, with that 3 0 defeat by Burnley at the weekend. Completely unacceptable scenes. I think we all agree with that. You know, I think everyone respects the rights of football fans to, to protest and, and to air their grievances you know, with the club. And they're obviously West Ham fans have got you know, many grievances with the way the club's run, as you say, Jerry. But to do it in that manner uh, and, and to. To have those kind of ugly scenes that we saw at the, at the London Stadium was just totally unacceptable, and and I thought it was a nice touch of the Burnley players to actually the substitutes and the, and the coaching yeah. staff to move off their bench to allow some young West Ham fans who are obviously frightened by the by the scenario and, and by the scenes they witnessed to actually allow them to sit on the on the bench there. Um, there are going to be sanctions against West Ham because About you cannot that. have that yeah. kind of thing happening in, so. in the modern game. But the stadium, I mean, you know, as, as, as many have said already in, in the papers today, the, the stadium is not designed for football. It's not set up for, for football. Um, you have to question the stewarding as well, mm. you know, the lack of stewarding, how these fans were able to get onto the pitch. We saw a similar situation, of course, with Wigan and Manchester City when they beat City early on in the FA Cup um, you know, a few weeks ago. Uh, and we don't want to see a return to the dark ages. We don't want to see fans, you know, spilling onto the pitch and, 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 the, and the aggression and the, and the potential for, for trouble. So uh, I think the FA will crack down on, Man, um, on West Ham rather, uh, and rightly so, because we cannot have these kind of scenes you know, marring football. Now that was an example, once again, of the story being about West Ham when Burnley had had a fantastic win, as it was yeah. on the opening day at Chelsea and yeah. several times over the season. Sean Dyche, he's on your patch up here in yeah. the North West. It's got to be, you know, we're all expecting that... Pep Guardiola is going to be manager of the season, yeah. but Sean has got to be a contender, isn't he? He's, Absolutely, he's got to get an honourable mention at least. Yeah, I mean, what they did, I mean, I uh, they had a sticky patch, didn't they? I think they, they didn't win for seven or eight games, maybe nine games. I think it was until until that win over West Ham at the, at the weekend. So, but all the work he's done this season, I mean, with that squad, with the limited resources he's got, the budget he has to work within the framework of that budget, it's absolutely extraordinary. I mean. I think when they beat Stoke, I think it was December, just before Christmas, they went into the top four for the first time. Yeah, they beat yeah. one nil with a late goal, I think, from Ashley Barnes. And, uh, you know, all right, they haven't managed to stay in the top four, but no one really expected them to. But to, to be seventh place, I think it is, or seventh or eighth at the yeah. moment, and to be punching above their weight the way they have. I mean, to be honest, I had them down as, as, as relegation candidates at the start of the season. I think many, probably many few, of us Probably did. a few did, yeah. So, yeah, I think Sean <coughs> Dyche, you know, certainly... As you say, Jerry, Pep's going to get manager of the year because there's every chance he can win the Premier League by a record margin, you know, and break all the records, points, goals scored, everything. Uh, but I do think Sean Dyche and, and Burnley deserve a huge credit for the way they've conducted themselves and the way they've, I say, punched above their weight because um, it's been a breath of fresh air to have them, you know, not, not sort of, you know, uh, gate crashing the established order, but certainly, you know, pushing them a little bit. And he's great with us, isn't he? He's always yeah, got a good is. line, he's fun, he's, yeah. he's engaging, and he always, you know, he's good socially yeah. as well, isn't he? He likes to sort of get to events, football writers' events and yeah. so on. Yeah, he, he, he makes himself available. I mean, I've only been up there a couple of times to Burnley this season, but I mean, when you go up there, it's, it's a bit of an education, because, you know, Manchester United, you know, you only get a, a, a short amount of time with Jose Mourinho. Yeah. Pep, to be fair, you know, you get half an hour with him. 
I think it was an hour or so with Sean Dyche, you know, and you come away and you go off on different tangents and everything, but he's very entertaining, he's a great company uh, and a great manager as well. So, uh, yeah, fair play to him. Fair play to him. Now, uh, I don't know if you saw it, a good, uh, interesting piece that Henry Winter did at the weekend with um, Eric Dyer, pretty much saying, you know, we don't, footballers don't just sit around talking about cars, they talk about Brexit, they talk about Pep's Catalonia, you know, the campaign for independence and, and support for the, for the Catalans. Um, VAR is obviously on their radar as well, but it's a nice piece with Dyer, which, which you know, sometimes I think it's easy for people to think the general public, the footballers are just a bit obsessed with money and cars and yeah. glitz and glands, simplistic but, things. But yeah. actually, there's some interesting and, and intelligent guys there, and we probably underestimate them at our peril, don't we? Yeah, I think so. I think I mean that's the popular perception, or even if you like misconception of footballers that that you know they come from working class backgrounds, they're uneducated, you know, football's their way out of this predicament if you like or the situation and that they haven't got the kind of the the mindset the mentality to, to look beyond football or, or, or look beyond you know issues outside of football more complex issues but you have here at Manchester United uh, probably one of the most erudite footballers around at the moment in one matter yeah absolutely um, you know who's done a lot with his common goal project yeah. um, you know very articulate again we talked about Sean Dyche having time for everybody one matter is a, a great example of that we're at this recent soccer X um, convention in Manchester and he was launching his common goal um, you know, charity and then the whole drive behind that and he gave a load of us you know yeah. he didn't want to leave didn't he? want to leave no yeah. and he was really good and I think you know that's I think that, that's been lost I think with journalists and mm. players in recent years and I think we're slowly getting back to a, a, a position of trust and respect and you know and, and I think we need to give players a bit of credit for, for you know giving yeah. us their time and also for, for having a kind of a hinterland outside of, of football you know like one matter has like Eric Dyer clearly has um, you know, not all footballers are uneducated. Not all footballers just have a very narrow tunnel vision of, of their lives. You know, some of them want to look beyond football and and uh, at issues outside of football. So I think, yeah, it, it's a, it's a fascinating read, um, and I think it, you know certainly Eric Dyer is a clearly intelligent young man. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's refreshing to see a player talk about things like Brexit and talk about things like the you know, different issues, political issues, and the, the beyond the, beyond the sphere of football. And then finally, um, the FWA had some big news today. We're going to have our first yep. women's footballer of the year. Yep. It will run in tandem with the footballer of the year, the male footballer of the year. Yeah. Although that is open to women to be voted for right. as well. But um, it's it's about time, isn't it? Twenty first yeah. century step forward, and it will be a big night on May the tenth when we announce our footballer of the year and our women's our first yeah. women's footballer of the year. I think it's long overdue. I think it's long overdue. I mean, the women's game has enjoyed such a not resurgence, but I mean, it's so popular now. Mm. And I think you know. You have teams like Manchester City, you know, who recently um, put their social media you know, on a par, the, the yeah. women's team on a par with the men's team, and say, look, we're one, we're one club, we're one Manchester City. You know, there's no differentiation between the men's game and the women's game. You know, so I think it's long overdue. I think you know, there's some there's some fantastic talent um, within the women's game. Obviously, Phil Neville has now you know crossed over and become become the manager of the England women's team. So I think it's long overdue. Um, I think women's football you know, needs to be celebrated and rightly so. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it'd be a great night and uh, there's certainly des some sort of deserving con contenders there uh, and talented women footballers um, who will be rightly recognised. Fantastic. David, thanks for your time. Cheers, this was sir. FWA Review from Old Trafford and uh, look out for us next week. Cheers.